I'm so glad to welcome to chapel today a longtime friend, Dr. Doug Birdsall. He's been our commencement speaker in the past. He was uh, president of the American Bible Society. He's been president of Asian Access. That's where he and I first got uh, working together when I served on his board during those days. We were involved with the Lausanne Committee for World Evangelization for many, many years together, especially as he led uh, the, the world in that great Congress in 2010 in Cape Town, South Africa, and uh, now serves as the honorary international chair of that wonderful movement. He's from Boston, Massachusetts, but I really consider Doug an ambassador of the world. He is connected all around the world, always thinks globally, always looking for how God is working in massive ways as God's people around the globe respond to his call. I know his message will be of help and a benefit to you today, and I'm glad that Doug can be with us for this chapel. A few days after the most recent Super Bowl, I stopped in the local Dunkin' Donuts to get a cup of coffee and a donut. As I was approaching the store, I saw two young men, they appeared to be construction workers, coming out of the store, talking in an animated voice. One of them said to the other, he's got six rings. Who are you going to compare him to? Joe Montana? Come on, man. He's the greatest of all time. About that moment, I bumped into them. I said, hey, you guys talking about me? <laughs> they looked at me, this old white-haired man, laughed and said, yeah, we were talking about you. Well, I wish they were talking about me. Wouldn't it be nice to be considered the greatest of all time in one category or another? I think we all do aspire to greatness. We want our lives to count. We don't want to be ordinary or average. I have three children. I know the dreams that I have nurtured for each one of them. I have a nine-year-old grandson, Kuiper, who just tried out this last weekend for Little League for the very first time. And like most every parent or grandparent, I wonder how far will he go? Might he be the next Derek Jeter? And I want your lives to count. I'm so glad that you are at a great university like Bellhaven. Like all of the chapel speakers this semester, I also am glad to be a friend of your president, Roger Parrott. He is a man who, like the great missionary pioneer to China, Hudson Taylor would say, expect great things from God, attempt great things for God. There are many good colleges and universities in our country, but there are really only a few great ones. The difference between a good university and a great one is to be measured not necessarily in the size of their endowment, the number of majors they offer, the prizes their faculty have won, or even the positions that their graduates have attained. Rather, the difference between a good university and a great university is the reality of a vision and a dream. All students are required to take a certain number of courses, to finish assignments, write papers, pass exams, complete internships, and pay your tuition on time. But great universities do more. They instill a vision and they nurture a dream. How will the students who come to our school make an impact for society? How will students who come to our Christ-centered college make a contribution to the work of the kingdom? But there is a tension, isn't there? As Christians, we live in two realms. We live in the kingdom of this world and also in the kingdom of God. And we live in two dimensions. We live in time and eternity. In this world, your greatness, success, and social status will be measured in terms of your education, your position, your income, the size and location of your home, the make of your car. But in the kingdom of God, it's a very different standard. It's an upside down kingdom. What I am sharing with you this morning, friends, grows out of my own experience, my own encounter with God and with the word of God when I was a student. It was during my final year in seminary that I was, as I was preparing to be a pastor, a person who was a son of a pastor, a person who loved the local church, that God met me in a very powerful and unforgettable way. Even though I wanted to serve God, I still entertained ambitions to be the pastor of a church that would also meet the this worldly standards of success by virtue of its size and by virtue of my reputation and place in society. 
but I came to realize that I must determine whether I was going to try to build a great career in which I would make a name for myself or if I would abandon myself to the cause of Christ in pursuit of the glory of his great name. That encounter with God and with the scriptures changed the entire trajectory of my life. It so happened that God redirected us to missionary service in Japan where we worked for 20 years. My father, who was himself a pastor, had reservations about that decision. He didn't think it was a great career move to start out in a country where there was so little response to the gospel or to join a small mission organization that so few people had heard of. But I told my father who I loved and who I wanted to please that I knew that my wife Jeannie and I were called. I told him I wanted to be willing to spend my life in obscurity on the backside of Japan, if that's what God had for us. But I also want to be prepared to assume a more expansive responsibility, if that was what God might have for us. I have served in both capacities, and it's all the same. It's in the service to him and for him. And so as a man who started college 50 years ago, I want to talk with you today about some of the things that I've learned about greatness in God's kingdom. I was pleased to learn that the vision statement of Bellhaven University is to prepare students academically and socially to serve Christ Jesus and their careers in human relationships and the world of ideas. You are being trained to be servants of Jesus Christ in all the spheres of your life. This is a distinctly Christian perspective on education and on the purpose of your life. As we consider the nature of true greatness, let's look to scripture. I wanna read from Matthew chapter 20 and verses 20 to 28. Matthew writes, then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus with her sons and kneeling down asked a favor of him, that is Jesus. What is it you want? Jesus asked. She said, grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right and the other at your left in your kingdom. Now the gospel writer Matthew is talking about James and John. They were the sons of Zebedee. James and John were part of the inner circle of the disciples. And so if anyone should have understood the kingdom that Jesus was, had come to establish, it would have been these two. The setting for this encounter takes place in the third year of Jesus' ministry. In the very next chapter of Matthew's Gospel, chapter 21, we read of the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. It's Holy Week, and these two guys still haven't grasped the essence of Jesus' mission. James and John got their mother to come to Jesus to make a, re a request on their behalf. I want my sons to have the positions of greatest privilege prestige, power, and recognition. I want them seated right next to you on your left and on your right. I want my boys to be great. On the one hand, I find this to be disgusting. It's arrogant and presumptuous. But on the other hand, when I look into my own heart and see my own motives, I realize that I too am too much like James and John. Now let's look at how Jesus responded, verse 22. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said to them. Can you drink the cup I'm going to drink? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will indeed drink from my cup, but to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared by my Father. Now what Jesus is saying essentially is this. James and John, you don't understand you don't comprehend the implications of your request. I'm going to Jerusalem to die. If you want to be at my right and my left, you must realize that you are actually asking to be crucified with me, one on the right and the other on the left. Let's continue in verse 24. Now, when the other 10 disciples heard about this, they were indignant with the two brothers. Jesus called them together and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and their high officials exercise authority and power over them. Not so with you. Instead, 
if you want to be great in God's kingdom. Do you want to be great in God's kingdom? Jesus is asking them. Jesus is asking us. Now the disciples are all leaning in. Of course, they want to be great. What's the key? What's the secret they want to know? If they have been paying attention, they will remember that this is at least the third time Jesus has spoken about greatness in the kingdom. In chapter 5 of Matthew's gospel, Jesus is talking about the law and the prophets. And he said, I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And then he says, but whoever practices and teaches these commands will be, will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. One mark of greatness in the kingdom is living a life in accordance with the teachings of Scripture. It's a matter of obedience. I'm so grateful that every year since Dr. Parrott has been the president of Bellhaven, he has chosen a scripture to be the verse of the year. I was at his installation 26 years ago in 1995, and I remember the first verse that he chose. And I have been following each year recently. He sent me a list of all of them. A foundation for your life. Get your instruction from the Bible. Jesus taught about greatness a second time in Matthew 18, verse 18. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Obviously, they're interested in this topic. Jesus called a little child to him and placed the child among them. And he said, truly, I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Get the point? Greatness is seen in the form of childlike faith and humility. And then this third time, Jesus said, if you want to be great in God's kingdom, learn to be the servant of all. And then Jesus adds, the son of man came not to be served, but to serve your university motto and to give his life a ransom for many. Friends, learn this lesson while you are young and you will build your life upon the rock-solid foundations of Jesus' own authoritative words. In his book, The Road to Character, the New York Times columnist David Brooks speaks to matters that are relevant to this discussion as we think about greatness in this world and greatness in the kingdom. David Brooks writes, it occurred to me that there were two sets of virtues, the resume virtues and the eulogy virtues. The resume virtues are the skills you bring to the marketplace. The eulogy virtues are the ones that are talked about at your funeral, whether you are kind, brave, honest, or faithful. Were you capable of deep love? We all know the eulogy virtues are more important than the resume ones. But our culture and our educational systems spend more time teaching the skills and strategies you need for career success than the qualities you need to radiate that sort of inner light. Many of us are clear on how to build an external career than how to build inner character. Well, we do learn how to build inner character and that comes from God's word, from Jesus himself. What we are talking about today has to do with the development of Christ-like character. As matters for our resume and our career, as well as for our eulogy, but far more importantly, for eternity. Friends, I want you to be great in God's kingdom. I want you to obey and imitate Jesus. The question is not about being the greatest of all time. The question is about being obedient and faithful in our time, in your time. David, the great king of the United Kingdom, of Israel and Judah, it is said of him, he fulfilled the purposes of God in his generation, in his time. May God help you to find the way. May he help you to be great in God's kingdom. It's the way less traveled. It's an uphill climb to the very end, but it leads to the celestial city. And when you get there, you will hear your master say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your reward. Live for Christ. Seek to be great for God's kingdom. Learn to be a servant of all. Live for time and eternity.
God bless you. Thank you.